doubtless you already have one of these. And if you do, even if you're not a blacksmith, it's a really good idea to get yourself one of these. Maybe not quite so big, but an anvil is a really good idea. If you'd like to know why, keep watching. I'm Joe Cadogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars. <laughs> Cheap. Australia only. Website. Card. Now, I'm not going to talk about cars today. I'm going to continue in this theme of shop talk and DIY and all of that good stuff. And you've already got yourself a vice, okay? Everyone's got a vice. This is pretty typical. It's a Dawn 4-incher made in Australia. You might have a slightly bigger vice. <sighs> Thing of beauty and joy to behold. Also not a bad deadlift. The number 5 Dawn cast steel offset vice. Beautiful but heavy. It could be a small vice. It could be a new vice. Or it could be one of these relatively lighter fabricated steel vices. But if you've got any such thing, they do come smaller, of course. Some say addiction, I say fascination. Tomato, tomato. Anyway, you got yourself a vice. It's the most used tool in the average workshop, right? Everything goes in the vise. If you know what's good for you, you're going to be angle grinding some piece of steel, getting the mill scale off it or just deburring it, whatever. You put it in a vise and that saves your hands because you get both hands on the grinder. The work is secure. You haven't got one hand holding it on the bench like this, which is a great way to cut your fingers off. So the vice has saved so many fingers and just it makes all kinds of work easier. And they're fantastic things, except they are so amenable to abuse. Like, I don't know if you can see this here, just out of shot, bugger. But my new cast iron vice has a big quote unquote anvil section at the back of it. And so does this little Chinese vice here. It's got a anvil section built into the back of it. So why would you actually need an anvil? It's invariably because what happens is you start hitting bigger and bigger stuff on your vise and you break it because it's made of cast iron. So I'm going to make a couple of observations about vices, right? Cast iron is a miraculous material. It's so good for vices because it's great at attenuating vibration and that means you can hit stuff with a hammer, you can do filing, you can do grinding and the material itself is really good at attenuating vibration. So that's lovely. But it's also a little bit brittle and the cheaper the vice, typically the more brittle the cast iron. So there's that. If you're just gonna straighten the odd nail or fold over a couple of bits of aluminium shim material and tap it down with a hammer, then the little anvil on the back of a vise is fine, right? That anvil will be fine. But any kind of serious work and you're really in danger of breaking your vise. The other thing about vices is, aside from hammering on them and breaking them, the other classic way to break a vise is by using it as a press because it is the fundamental workshop press isn't it you know like it's a screw press and it functions as a press if you've got a piece of I don't know 10 or 12 millimeter bar and it's got a bit of a bend in it you can put it in the vise and hammer it straight or you can put it in the vise and bend it straight or you could put it in the vise and press it straight and that's fine except if you find yourself reaching for a dirty big piece of pipe because you just need more leverage. This is also a fantastic way to break your vice. And I'd suggest, therefore, that the two best upgrades you can get that you'll use all the time once you've got them is a small hydraulic press or an arbor press. Fantastic. Get both. Hey. And an anvil. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about anvils today. We'll save presses perhaps for another day. Anvils are really good because they're hard to break. This is an, a Chinese import from Vivor, right? Vivor.com.au. I'll put links to all of this stuff in the description. They did send it to me. They're not getting any say in what I say about it. But 
for the money, I think it's absolutely brilliant. This is 60 kilos, so it's quite a hefty lift. You would not run uphill with it. You wouldn't want to drop it on your foot. And you might not need one quite this hefty, but they make this style of anvil in 60, 50, 40, 30, and 20 kilo variants. And they vary in price. This one's $443 and the lightest one is 139 and they step down incrementally because you know it, you're paying for the mass basically and therefore there is an anvil to suit you and you probably don't need 60 kilos of anvil and something i can tell you uh, the the benefit of a painful lesson is that the bigger the tool you think these big tools are cool you buy yourself a big lathe or you buy yourself a big drill press or you buy yourself anything big and you think yes but then reality bites and you have to move it around, right? You have to assemble it. The head of the big drill press over there, I can't lift it up. I need, that's why I put the chain block in the roof, just so that I can lift up heavy stuff like that. So there's a cost and you want to think, I think you want to think about how small can you get away with, with all of this stuff? Can you get away with a mini lathe? Can you get away with a 10 ton hydraulic press that just sits on the bench? Because you can pick that up like that when you don't need it on the bench. If you buy yourself a heavy 30, 40, 50 ton press, that'll do a lot of work, but you're going to need a crane to move it. So there's that. And this is kind of that. This is the biggest anvil they make. And I wanted to show it to you like this, basically as a photographic prop. The reason I wanted to investigate this is, have you looked at the price of anvils? Like, Jesus, they're really expensive things. Even the used ones. I had a bit of a look just before pressing record on the camera here. I found uh, five used anvils on the first few pages of Gumtree, which is like a Australian Facebook marketplace kind of thing, or Australian eBay kind of thing. I found one that's 135 kilos, so roughly double the weight of this baby plus a bit, 1,350 bucks. Didn't seem to be in fantastic condition. I found a 28 pound one, which is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, 700 bucks, which is almost twice as much as one of these, not quite twice as much, but almost. I found a 72 kilo one for 1,200 bucks, which is roughly triple the price of this version. 38 kilos for 900 bucks and 160 kilos for 1,500. The problem with 160 kilos and the other one for 135 kilos is how are you going to move it? Do you need a surface that big? Because the benefit of the weight is inertia apart from anything else. It's not going to move when you sandwich a big hammer between it and the work, right? That's what you're kind of paying for. So the first question you're going to ask yourself, I suppose, is how heavy is the work I'm going to do and what can I get away with? And I'd suggest 30 kilos would be more than adequate for most people, half the size, really easy to move around. There was a bit of palaver moving this one in here because A, the driveway is really steep and then you got to get it in here. And although I'm not too bad at deadlifting 70, 80, 90 kilos, this isn't a deadlift, right? This is a box and you've got to get it off the deck and then you've got to half clean it up so you can get it onto the table. And if you drop it on your foot, that's going to be kind of memorable, even in safety boots. So you got to think smart about what size anvil you want, but I'm assuming that all of these anvils are scale models of each other, and therefore the comments I'm going to make about this one and why I'd prefer to go with this one as opposed to a very used anvil that's quite old for significantly more money. The first thing you've got to understand about a good anvil is that it's not made of cast iron. It's made of steel. It's typically cast steel. And then in the olden days, what they do, what they did was they forge welded a piece of steel on top and they hardened it. So they got a piece of high carbon steel on top, forge welded to the anvil and they hardened it. And I guess the other way of doing it would be to case harden a piece of uh, low carbon steel, but only on the top. The problem with case hardening, of course, is it's very thin. So Vivor tells me that this anvil has a hardness on the face here of 50 Rockwell C, which is pretty hard, but not ridiculous. Not very likely to chip, in other words. And there's always a balancing act with 
steel, which is the harder you make it, the more brittle it becomes, which is why if you ever manage to bend a drill, it's all over and <laughs> you don't bend it. It just falls apart into two pieces and you go looking for another drill, right? So it's drills are typically made of high-speed steel. It's very hard. It's got a lot of carbon in it and the price you pay is the brittleness of the drill. Same goes for end mills and all sort of precision cutting tools of that nature. This is like one step down. It's more like about as hard as you'd make a hatchet, I suppose, or an axe. So it's it's durable enough. And I did a test on this when I unboxed it. You just get your little ball peen hammer, the smallest one, and you just move it all over. And I hope this doesn't peak on the audio, but you just do this. And what you're basically doing all over the face is just feeling for the rebound and you want to check for any dead spots because that would indicate some sort of defect where the hardness had fallen over and I can't find one I've gone absolutely all over this part of the face with the ball peen hammer and it's uniformly hard the rebound is extremely uniform and that makes me feel pretty good about the quality control as far as that goes and obviously as you move out here the tone and the rebound changes but that's a function of the cantilever and the inevitable resonance that you get from being so far from any visible means of support you're a long way out back here therefore that feels a bit more dead than here or here but this is where you're going to do most of your work and this is only ever going to be for light work anyway where you bend something or straighten it out whatever over a, a sharper edge now the other thing I'd suggest about this is it's got a hardy hole here and it's got a pritchell hole here. And I'm not sure how practical the pritchell hole is, especially in this location. I'm not planning on using the pritchell hole very much, but the hardy hole, maybe. And I'd have to say that the face itself is really flat. And if you want to test anything, uh, if it's flat, you can get yourself a precision straight edge like this. This is a precision ground uh, carbon steel uh, straight edge. It's a ruler on one end and it's a straight edge as well on the other end. It sits up on its own. And the way to do the test is just to get a flashlight and you just shine the light behind the straight edge and you see if any comes through. And if you don't see any light leaks, then guess what? It's pretty flat. So I tested this way in three locations and this way in about four locations. It's very flat. Like this has been surface ground. You can tell from the marks. It's not a milled finish. It's a surface ground finish. They've done a really good job getting it flat and they've done a really good job getting it hard. So that's a huge plus. It's going to be extremely functional. The hardy hole is just as cast and the edge is very sharp, which brings me to the first criticism here, which is although this edge that you can see here has been ground for some reason, presumably because it had a bit of casting flashing on it or something, I don't know. But the rest of it is sharp enough after the surface grinding process to cut yourself on. So if you buy an anvil like this, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is radius these corners to some degree. And the conventional way to treat the radius with an anvil is to give yourself a sort of big radius in some locations and a smaller radius in others so that you can match the curvature that you're trying to achieve on the edge with whatever different uh, part of the edge you want to work at, right? So if you've got some nice sharp edges here, that's okay. But maybe you want a bit more rounded edge here and maybe make one of these edges sharp and one of these edges a bit more rounded so that you've got just a variety of radius profiles to work off when you're bending something. And dude, that's only going to take you, what, five minutes, 10 minutes with a flap disc like a 60 to 120 grit flap disc would do that in no time flat. The other thing I'd suggest about the anvil while you've got your angle grinder out is you're probably going to want to dress up the round horn because this is an area that's going to do a lot of work. If you ever upgrade, get yourself an LPG burner or a forge or something like that, you'd be able to use it as if you were a blacksmith and round a few things over. And with the steel that hot, every defect, every little lump and grain that's left over from the casting process is going to come through into the work, which 
you'd best avoid. So while you're out there dressing these radii here, you probably want to go down about an inch and take the paint off as well and just make that nice and smooth as you go around the, the flat surface. Then go around the curved surface as well and make that as smooth as you possibly can. You might also investigate maybe dressing it right up if you want a really smooth anvil. Hold that thought. You can, of course, get yourself these kinds of paint stripping discs from uh, for your angle grinder, right? And they're sort of uh, almost Scotch-Brite. They're like, if Scotch-Brite were given the Captain America treatment, then Steve Rogers turned into Captain America. This is what happens to Scotch-Brite when you turn it into Captain America. It's really good for stripping the paint off something like this, but once you've got it ground nice and flat, you can dress it right up with something of this nature and just polish it up a little bit. And if you want to go even more to town, you can get physical Scotch-Brite scourers for die grinders. Um, die grinder. Okay, so here's two flavors of die grinder. There's your 90 degree die grinder. It's already got a little flap disc on a little zirconium flap disc. And they're fantastic. You, know, you can just dress these up. You can get longer ones as well. And obviously these work in conjunction with these little sanding pad thingos that go in the collet chuck of your die grinder. So you get one of those little sanding pads and Edward die grinder hands here. We'll just see if we can't do this quickly. They just screw on like that and they stay in place. Obviously, wear your safety specs when you do anything like this and don't stand in the plane of rotation of the disc. Get it down here and be above it so if something goes wrong, if it comes off at high speed, you're not in the line of fire. At least the eyes that you can never replace will not be in the line of fire. So you can sex up these. You can sex it up infinitely and the amount of sex up is absolutely down to you, dude. But I'd suggest that the price that you pay for something like this versus what you pay for a used one in dubious condition is worth the half an hour to infinity time that you might spend sexing it up with an angle grinder and a die grinder if you've got a compressor. Actually, air tools are really cheap and really nice to use. So compared with using an angle grinder, something like this is beautiful. Uh, compared with using a plug-in angle grinder particularly, an air angle grinder is just a delight to use, but they do consume a fair bit of air, so you need a beefy compressor to run them. These things, not so much. You don't need to spend so much on a compressor to run a die grinder. So there's that. The other thing about used anvils, right, is that they're of dubious quality and that means that the forge welded hard bit on top which is so essential to the functionality of an anvil often chips and breaks away and repairing it is not all that straightforward i mean you can get hard facing stick welding rods and you could have a crack at uh, at repairing anything that's chipped away but once that start that defect starts to happen if it's a, an adhesion problem between the hard layer and the body of the anvil itself it's likely to keep coming back and haunting you which would gut you wouldn't it if you just spent I don't know 1700 bucks on a used anvil because you know they don't make them like they used to kind of thing Whereas the risk factor with an anvil like this is like $440 and you know what you're getting. It's just going to be a little bit rough cast in places. And uh, I'm not so sure about the Pritchell hole, right? I'd have, to, I'd have to really think about that. And obviously, if you bolt through the Pritchell hole extension and the Hardy hole extension down here, you can't get the added stability of putting a long square bar right down into this hole. So you might think about, I'll have to have a think about this as well, but how am I going to attach it to the stand and what kind of stand am I going to use? There are going to be a couple of questions that I'll have to cross that bridge a little bit later. First thing I'm going to do with this baby is dress it up with the angle grinder, get the radii on the corners of the machined face and I'm going to smooth up the round horn. And uh, the other thing to bear in mind is you can get other anvils from Vivor as well. You can get one with just a single horn and a square edge across here. But these are cast steel and their description on their website of the ones without the second horn are cast iron. And a cast iron anvil is going to be 
in many ways a lower performance product than something like this which will be extremely durable when it comes to being struck over and over and over hundreds of times and when you think about it you know when you look at a vice even a fairly basic antique dawn vice like this i picked this one up the other day and it cost me a couple of hundred bucks so if you break it it's really hard to fix because cast iron doesn't weld. And that means if you break it, you'd have to braze it and you need a lot of heat to braze a big thick chunk of cast iron. It's gonna be as strong as it was, but it's never gonna look as good and it's a pain in the ass doing it. And you'd gut yourself because someone owned that vice for years and managed not to break it by using it as a press or hammering on it excessively. and ham-fisted dickhead went out and broke it so well done so what i'm saying essentially is horses for courses right the vice is a fantastic device on your bench top for holding a piece of work for drilling sawing grinding filing sanding whatever that's what it's designed to do and you can use the screw thread as a quasi press as long as you don't overdo it if you find yourself reaching for the pipe ba -ba -oh, bad idea okay and likewise there's no problem with getting some light steel and putting it in the vise and hammering it over like yeah approved but if you're putting a piece of steel like this in your vise 12 millimeters thick and you're getting out the big sledgy you might want to rethink that because that is a job that is better done with a piece of hot steel on an anvil it maybe it's maybe it's better done in a press with a brake you know like a big fat piece of v grooved whatever and a matching brake that just down on top of it you could do that in a press easy maybe a 20 ton press would do that pretty easy you just cut it in half right if you want to bend it at 90 degrees just cut it in half and weld it the point I'm making is if you find yourself looking down the barrel of this and you're reaching for a hammer to bend this, you're doing something wrong and it's more likely than not going to end in tears. So that's my little thesis on how to expand your workshop capability. And I guarantee that if you were to purchase even a 20 kilo anvil, which would be one third the size of this. You could basically pick it up one-handed and it will just expand the repertoire of what you can hit with impunity in your shed if you've got the right stand. In my view, the 60 kilo one is fantastic. It's a bit hard to move around. I'll probably put it in the other fat cave. And if I was gonna spend my own money, I'd be thinking whether or not I could get away with 30 or 40 kilos, would they perhaps not be adequate because of the whole big tool, not always better thing. Now I'll put links to all of the Vivo anvils in the description and I'll pin them to a comment. Uh, they're not paying me to say anything about this. If I hated this anvil, I was just gonna say, look dudes, I hate it. I don't wanna review it, but I actually don't hate it. I think it's extremely good value for money. And the thing that stopped me buying an anvil to this point has just been the staggering cost like the staggering cost of used anvils of dubious quality that might be halfway to failing or beyond that and the new ones if you look at the price of new anvils like whew, they do see you coming somewhat although there is a lot of work in it now there are some defects some casting defects not so much visible on the face but if you turn the anvil over which is a fun job. Hashtag the big tool, not always better. There's a small void in here and there's a bit of a dag just there. Okay, but, and they've done some grinding here around the bottom of the Pritchell hole. It's a uh, pretty rough machining on the bottom of the anvil here, but it is flat. It doesn't rock on a flat surface, so that's good. That bodes well for installation. And you can clean up this uh, dag here on the bottom of the square horn really easily while you're cleaning everything else up. And that's just cosmetic. You're never going to see it. So the bottom line here is the quality is acceptable, like a lot of inexpensive manufacturing they haven't spent a lot of time or effort 
on the finesse. They haven't deburred the holes or done that kind of thing. But if you're prepared to spend half an hour to an hour sexing the thing up, then you could easily do that. And with the money you've saved by purchasing this kind of anvil, you'll be massively in front. Plus, it's just... It's just really good to have something like this because, you know, you can use it for so many different things and... Yeah, maybe the 30 or 40 kilo one might be the way to go. Unless you're a blacksmith, of course. Just saying. Link's in the description, dude. Thanks for sticking around for this. I know it's not about cars, but... I do intend to do a little bit more tool time on the channel and I'd love you to tell me what you think of that as well. As an idea, would you stick around for that or do you want me just to shut up on this front and go back to trash talking car makers behaving badly? Which is not something I'm going to stop, by the way.